When I was a kid, my mom and I lived in a somewhat sucky neighborhood in Chicago. Despite the condition of the neighborhood, the apartment complex where we lived, however, was fantastic. Our top floor unit had a fireplace that saved our lives in the winter, and a nice quality AC that iced out the front of the area of the unit in the summer. But the back area remained hotter than hell. Because of the temperature on hot days, my mom and I would camp out in the living room to sleep on those nights. Anyway, despite the rough neighborhood, I remember having a good childhood in the short time we were there. Maybe because my mom always made sure to protect me from the parts of the neighborhood that were exceptionally rough. So, on one winter night, our apartment was freezing cold. My mom told me to grab my pillows and the blanket because we we're going to have a sleepover in the living room. She popped some popcorn, made hot chocolate, one with no marshmallows for me, and one loaded with them for her. We ate and drank and watched Christmas movies before I passed out. Clearly white girl wasted on hot chocolate. At some point in the middle of the night, I woke up to go to the bathroom and saw movement in my kitchen. I don't know if it was because I was stupid tired or oblivious to whatever was going on, but I called out, Mommy? Even though she was asleep on the couch next to me. The person, who I soon realized was a guy because of his huge stature and lack of hair under the mask he wore, walked over and crouched down to eye level in front of me and whispered, Shh. I simply shrugged, went to the bathroom, and went back into the living room to go to sleep. And that was that. The guy was no longer there, and the door was left slightly ajar. I chalked it up to one of those lucid dreams, and filed it away in my repressed memories. I do, however, remember moving the next day into my grandparents' place for about a month, until we found something. Because I was so young, my mom never told me why, not until I was grown at least. The topic of the apartment randomly came up in conversation, and I offhandedly told her about the dream I remembered I had, and this is the terrifying conversation that ensued. I said to her, did I ever tell you about the weird dream I had? She replied, no, I don't think so. What dream? After I told her, she went pale as a ghost. Now, my mother is a dark-skinned black woman, so seeing her go pale scared the hell out of me. She said to me, That wasn't a dream, honey. That really happened. Now it was my turn to go pale. I felt my stomach fall to my ass, and stared at her like, Speak. Go on. Why are you silent? She then said to me, I woke up in the middle of the night, and this, this man was standing above me, staring. I remember immediately demanding, where is my child? Where is my child? I tried to get up, but he growled, and then he whispered angrily, don't move. At this, I started tearing up. I saw the fear in her eyes. The utter terror of thinking something had happened to her only child. I hated seeing my mom so upset. It's been just us practically all of my life. So to imagine her having to move herself and the young girl out of a neighborhood from sheer terror is hard to say the least. She then said, the man just continued to stare at me. He rushed out of the apartment when he heard you flush the toilet and he left everything he was going to steal. The next morning, I packed up our stuff and we went to live with Nana and Papa. Child, I left all the furniture, plates, silverware, TV, and everything else. I just got our clothes and got the hell out of Dodge. But because we vacated the lease, it kind of messed up my credit, but I just couldn't imagine sleeping in that place another night. We just sat there in silence, freaking out because my dream, which happened to actually not be a dream, was all too real. I'd say it was simply a drug addict trying to make off with some stuff, but why walk up to a child and tell her to be quiet instead of just leaving with what you already packed? Why stare at a woman, make her lie still in place, and then leave when the kid comes out of the bathroom? Just why?
This happened about a month ago, and it still comes up in conversation because we genuinely don't know what happened. It was around 7pm in November, so it was past dark in Metro Detroit. I was driving and my fiancé was riding passenger. We were exiting a pretty populated highway when we turned onto a mile road near the city's shopping mall and outlet centers. Being in close proximity to the mall, it was strange the boulevard was that empty at that time of night. So we're driving on the deserted westbound side of the boulevard when we noticed there was a stopped vehicle in the middle lane. Again, it was dark, aside from the street lights that lined the road every 80 yards or so, but their brake lights were obviously lit, and we were approaching quick. My fiancé and I were talking in the car at the time, when we both kind of stopped to verbally question what we were both seeing. It was strange behavior, especially because the speed limit is 45 to 50 miles on this mile road. You do not want to be stopped, especially this close to people exiting the highway, so we slowed down since we were cautious drivers. We approached and passed the vehicle in the far left lane, as it was in the middle, and when we were about a car length in front of it, the driver gunned it and started speeding to catch up to us. We never left our left-hand lane, but at this point I was braking. Because again, the behavior was off and we noticed that driving was sporadic. Braking was almost instinctual, as much as it probably wasn't safe to do so. Continuing to drive down the smile road, we noticed the driver was swerving the car between the middle lane and the left lane, as if trying to intentionally sideswipe us. Instant red flag. It wasn't like the driver was intoxicated or texting and just doing a poor job to stay in their lane. This was the driver in control of their swerving and coming dangerously close to hitting the side of my Jeep going 45 miles per hour. Bad vibes. Before we knew it, we were blinded by a spotlight coming from the driver's window straight into my car via the passenger window. I have 20 tints on my Jeep windows, which usually help control the brightness of the sun most mornings and evenings. And even with the tents, this spotlight stunned us, and we couldn't see anything but white. I didn't have time to check any mirrors before slamming on my brakes. I'm not sure I would have even been able to see in my mirrors after being blinded. I remember my fiancé screaming, What's going on? We opened our eyes, and the driver was yards ahead of us, speeding to get away. I had my fiancé dial 911 immediately. I don't take bullshit so I started racing down the road to catch up to him, looking for a license plate number or something. In Michigan, we have Michigan left turn lanes, and I could see the vehicle up ahead turning into one to enter the mall parking lot, which is a huge roundabout. The roundabout speed limit is approximately 25 miles per hour, with frequent stop signs and intersections. My fiancé connected with dispatch on the phone as I was trying desperately to catch up to this vehicle. They were blowing every red light, and stop sign in sight. Dispatch recommended we don't follow, but I did anyways because I was really upset. I was committed to grabbing the plate number, but from a safe distance and at a safe speed, there was no way I was going to tell this person when we didn't know if they had a weapon or something. Long story short, this driver knew we were following them. They were speeding through the roundabout, cutting other drivers off, and blowing intersections when we lost sight of them. At this point, the police said the cops in the area were already on their way looking for a vehicle we described and that we should leave them to it. We weren't going to jeopardize our safety and the safety of other drivers just because I was pissed. So we stopped our chase but still crossed an intersection into another shopping center. Across the street we saw the driver enter. We figured we could prowl instead of chase in case we saw them again. We never found that car again. We never found out who the driver was, what his motive was, or if the cops found him. We knew it was a male driver because we saw him through the driver's side window before he blinded us. It was a white male, dark ball cap. He drove a dark sedan. It looked like a newer Ford Fusion. It was a close run in, and I'm not sure what would have happened if he had successfully crashed into us on that deserted mile road, or if his spotlight had successfully veered my car off the road. We don't think this was a case of road rage, since we didn't do anything to provoke him. This just happened in front of my house, and I've been staring at my computer confused ever since. I was at my computer and my dog starts nudging my elbow. He signals that he needs to go outside. 
I get up, put on my shoes and coat, get him on the leash and move to the front door so I can take him out in the front yard. Taking him out in the front is not something I usually do, but my shoes and coat are right by the door, so I figured why not? We can go out the front tonight. As soon as I open my door, I see there is a person crossing my driveway. It's dark but they are lit by my lamppost in my front yard. They see me exiting my house and stop dead in their tracks. I did not expect this, so I stop dead in mine. We have a staring contest for a bit, I guess. Well, I say I guess because I'm really blind without my glasses, and I cannot see if this person is actually making eye contact with me. They could just be looking somewhere else. But after a time, they keep walking. All right, I thought. Well, my dog still needs to pee, so we're not going back inside. He is a large German Shepherd mix at least, so I'm not terribly afraid of anyone attacking me. They would have to deal with him first. So I close my door, walk onto my porch and head outside. The person is still standing in front of my house. They begin talking to me. I'm going to use she here because it was a distinctly feminine voice, but like I said earlier, I have no idea who they were because I wasn't wearing my glasses. She asked me if I knew where Motor Road was. I have lived in this house for a few years and lived in this town for almost 10 years. I have never heard of this road. No, I'm sorry, I told her. She looked down the road back the way she came and asked, Well, do you know how I can find my way? I think I'm lost. It's about 28 degrees Fahrenheit where I live right now and you don't want to be outside at night for very long. There is a gas station back that way, down on the corner. They might be able to help you, I said. She knew of the gas station and named it. Then she said, and I can't go that way. I'm trying to go away from that way. So I said, well, there are more gas stations in the opposite direction. It's just a little further. And I proceeded to tell her to go down the end of my street, take a ride, Keep going past William Street. And as soon as I mentioned William Street, she clasped her hands together and lit up. She interrupted me and said, Are you sure? William Street is right there. Yes, I said. It's just the next one over. Oh my god, thank you so much. I'm trying to get to my safe place, she said. No problem, you're welcome, I replied. And she thanked me over and over but that one line stuck out in my head. Her safe place. Before I could think about it any further, or ask her about it, she took off running. I'm talking she took off running, like zombies were chasing her, like her life depended on it. She ran down my street the direction I pointed her in, and she disappeared into the darkness. When I got inside after my pup did his business, I sat and thought about what had just happened. I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling I got. I reviewed what happened in my head over and over. She can't go that way. She needs to go to her safe place. She seems lost and scared. She's asking random strangers for help at night. Red flags are going off everywhere. I called the police non-emergency number and explained what had just happened. I wasn't sure if it warranted a 911 call because no one was in immediate danger that I knew of. I just wanted someone to be aware that there was this person alone at night, needing help for whatever reason. The officer on the other end of the call didn't seem convinced it was anything to be concerned about, until I told him about the safe place line. When I said that, there was a pause. He took all the necessary information and told me that they would be sending someone out to my area to make sure she was alright if she needed help. And he thanked me for calling. So, what happened here? Did I do good? I hope she's alright. The thing that gets me the most is the timing of it all. She crossed my driveway at the exact moment that I opened my door. She was walking fast, and a few seconds later and she would have been beyond my house and down the street in the darkness. It's a quiet neighborhood. I highly doubt she would have run into anyone else outside, besides myself and my dog, and I just happened to come outside at that exact moment. 
and that's just weird. So this all happened throughout my high school experience. I'm currently a janitor at my school, and this all started the second semester of my freshman year. The first incidents were closer to the end of my freshman year. There were a few my sophomore year, and there's only been one so far into my junior year. And it's all completely true. I tried looking for the police records that go with it, but I couldn't find anything. It's probably due to how long ago it was. I'm going to give some background quickly just so you better understand what I'm getting at. Hi, I'm Itsy Bitsy. I'm a 5'2", 100-pound female that looks like a 12-year-old boy, pretty much Jordan Baker from The Great Gatsby, complete with the athletic body and undercut hairstyle. And setting-wise, my bedroom window is ground level. Part of my room was above ground. The other half was underground. My window was at grass level, so you could sit down on the grass outside my window and see directly through to my room if you look straight ahead. The guy in question, we'll call Alex. He had really short hair, and he was something like five foot four. He's in the same grade as my older sister, too. He's an avid user of cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, and the likes. He even bragged to me that he got his license taken away from him because he went 60 miles per hour above the speed limit on a highway. A highway with a speed limit of 65 miles per hour That meant he was going at least 125 miles per hour. So basically, a really ill-behaved boy was chasing a really good girl. And now here's the story. I hope it makes everyone who hears this a little more careful when making new friends. The second semester of my freshman year, I took an art class in hopes to get an elective credit. I was sitting with some friends talking about the projects we were making, and Alex walks through. I'd never noticed him in the class before, which was strange. I should also put this on a timeline for you, to make things easier to follow. It was close to prom season, so early March kind of time, and luckily, close to the end of the year. He started talking about whatever, and we really hit it off. After a week, I started seeing him pop up around me, in the hallways outside my classes, and he talked to me during passing time. I didn't think much of it, being the stupid and naive child I was. I should also mention that he rode my bus in the afternoon, after school. Alex and I would sit by each other on the bus and talk too, which just encouraged further interactions with them. One day, my older sister, who was two grades above me, didn't have theater practice after school, so she took the bus home. She got on, and when she saw me sitting next to Alex, her face turned white. She sat down near the front of the bus. I thought it was really strange, so I planned on asking her about it when I got off the bus, but I forgot to. Just remember that for later. As prom got even closer, Alex kept talking about it with me. My friends and I all assumed he was going to ask me, because not only did he follow me around and wouldn't shut up about it, he was clearly showing signs of interest in me. Unfortunately for him, however... I was in a relationship with someone at the time, and it was a girl. I had absolutely no interest in dating him. If he did ask me, though, I'd have to say we'd go as friends. Thankfully, Alex told me instead that he'd like me to tell Tanya that if she didn't have a date, that he'd bring her. Almost immediately remembering the incident on the bus, I just said, she's got a date already, but thanks. Just wanting to protect her. Over the next few days, Alex actually stated talking about sexual statistics. Things like the average length of someone's manhood, or the average age someone has their first time. I got super uncomfortable about this, and told some of the boys in my class that if he brought it up again, I'd go sit with them. They gladly offered to protect me. This was my first set of red flags. Another instance that set off red flags about Alex was when I was at home. The doorbell rang. I looked out the window, and Alex was there. This wasn't the strangest part, because I got off the bus before Alex did, so he saw where I lived. I yelled to my mom that someone was here to see me, 
and I went out to the porch to talk to him. He was with his friends and yelled to them that he was going to catch up to them later and he wanted to talk to me first. He told me about some mundane stuff and I was getting bored. So bored in fact that I just bluntly decided to ask him if he liked me. I was tired of him always beating around the bush. I just wanted a damn answer. Alex kind of froze and danced around the subject, confirming my suspicions. The way he avoided telling me that he liked me was really strange, bragging to me about his drugs and illegal escapades. My dad was also just coming home from work too at the time, so I had an excuse to leave the really uncomfortable situation. When my dad came in the house, he told me about how nice Alex seemed, and I looked over to Tanya. She looked upset about it, but neither of us said anything. Later though, not on the same day, I posted a picture on my Instagram and he commented on it. I still don't know how he got my Instagram to this day. He commented his phone number, telling me to text him, and that my dad was really chill. Along with the demand for me to text him, he continued to almost harass me on the direct messaging on Instagram, asking to hang out. This was another red flag that set things off for me, making me weary of him, and I decided that I needed to be careful with him from now on. In early May, he continued to follow me from class to class, but from a further distance. This was absolutely mortifying, but my girlfriend at the time thought it was hilarious. She said that it was funny seeing a straight boy chase a gay girl that he had no chance with. I laughed with her on the outside, but internally I was scared. It was in the same time frame that he actually showed up in my window. I should mention that my parents weren't home at this time either. They were out shopping while all my sisters were at home with me. I was done with all my homework, and I was practicing my makeup skills so I could do the makeup of a few girls that were going to prom. I had my earbuds in and was listening to my music when I heard some sort of tapping noise. I took them out, listened intently for a minute, then popped them back in. I heard the tapping noise again and took my earbuds out once more, listening again. This happened a few more times, until I just kept my earbuds out permanently. I finally heard it again. I found it to be coming from my window. I quickly wiped off my makeup, grabbed a pocket knife that I kept under my pillow, and opened my curtains. I saw Alex standing there. He was strangely dressed in a three-piece tuxedo with a single white rose. He said something, and I couldn't hear him through the glass. I yelled through the glass that I was coming outside to talk to him. As I walked up the stairs to go outside, Tanya came up to me, terrified. She told me not to go outside, and I asked why. She said that Alex was outside, and that he was dangerous. She revealed to me that he stalked her for her freshman year. He followed her all around the way he did with me. We both panicked together, and I heard the garage door open, signaling that our parents were home. We ran to the foyer, telling our dad that Alex was outside, and that he needed to do something. He walked over to the side of my house where my window was, and proceeded to talk to him. I never knew what was said, but it kept Alex away for a while, which was nice. But things suddenly got a lot worse. Alex started talking to me again, but this time it was about sex and drugs. Much worse than before, too telling me about all the drugs he had with him and about all the girls he's been with, going into extreme detail. I went to go sit with the other boys in the art class, but it did nothing. He still talked about it, even making one of the hockey players uncomfortable. They did their best to shield me, but it only went so far. This was my final red flag before I deleted his number and blocked him on Instagram. I was too uncomfortable to put myself through any more social interactions with them. The worst it had gotten, though, was two days before the last day of school. I was getting ready for bed around 10pm when I heard a knock at my window. I once again grabbed my knife and looked out my window, assuming the worst but praying for it to be just the bushes outside my window. I saw the dark outline of a figure and my heart dropped. I knew it was Alex. I closed my curtains and ran upstairs to my parents' room, almost in tears about Alex being at my window. 
My dad and I went back down to my window, and no one was there. My dad thought Alex could still be there, just hiding in the bushes outside my window. My dad decided to scare him off. He went to turn the porch lights on and call for my dogs. I didn't get any more knocks at my window for maybe two minutes. I heard another knock and told my dad. He just marched straight outside at this point and found him sitting by my window with his hood up. I don't know what happened, but the police were called. They had to escort him back to his house. It was terrifying, but I was pissed at that point. Why couldn't he just leave me alone? It doesn't stop there, however. The next day during my math class, I sat in a spot that faces the window with my back to the door. Halfway throughout the hour, one girl in the class shouts out my name, telling me to look behind me. I turn around, as does the rest of the class, and there was Alex, standing intently above me, silent. I got up, ready to punch him in the face, but he ran out the door. I just stood in the doorway of the room and broke into tears. Three other people comforted me, and my girlfriend told the teacher what was going on. The scariest part, however, was that I never told him my schedule. Later that day, my mom, Tanya, and I went to the police liaison at our school to get something done. When the officer said we could do a no-contact agreement, we ruled it out because it would take too long to put in place and there was only a few days left in the school year. Later, when the officer talked to Alex, asking him why he did what he did, he said it was because neither me nor my sister told him no. It was the end of the year, and nothing happened with him over the summer. My sophomore year, though, I had another class with him. I took this class because my girlfriend and I had a bad breakup, and I needed to change my schedule to avoid her. I immediately told the teacher about everything so that she knew, and everyone in the class protected me from him. I had no further incidents with him. The teacher cared a lot about me and is now one of my close friends. My sophomore year was clear of any incidents, and I had pretty much forgotten he existed until recently. I woke up and checked my phone after turning off the alarm. I saw I had gotten a random Facebook message from someone I didn't know. My Facebook is about as private as it gets so I didn't know that it was possible to receive messages from people that I wasn't friends with on Facebook. My sophomore year, Alex was supposed to graduate, but he didn't. His name wasn't even said at the ceremony and wasn't even listed in the program. Tanya and I laughed about it, but we both knew that it meant he was going to be in our city longer. I looked at the message, and it was very sexual. It was annoying and I get messages similar to that all the time from bots on Instagram, so I would have ignored it. But because it was on Facebook Messenger, it was strange. I clicked on the person's name, and their profile came up. I scrolled through their pictures, and I saw a picture that made my heart sink. A picture of Alex. It was Alex's profile, and he had messaged me. He changed the profile's name and location, I only showed it to a few people, but not yet to my parents. I showed it to my current boyfriend, who showed it to his mom. She was a chemistry teacher at the high school that we attended. She told me to tell my parents. The reason we showed it to a teacher was because he'd been seen around the school grounds within the last few weeks, and she may have been able to do something about it. Nothing has happened since with Alex, but if something else does happen, there is a chance he won't make it out of the situation alive because I'm fed up with him, and he's caused me and my family enough grief. Please be careful who you choose to make friends with, and what sort of information you give out. Don't put yourself what I've been through, please. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Let me know what you thought of the stories in the comments, and do me a favor and drop a like. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications too. I want to give a shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Linda, Christina De La Rosa, Fire05, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, 
Shan, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, Jody, Gemma Allen, James Gorgono, Monica Levelace, Courtney Maxwell, Alex, and Elena Renee. If anyone else fancies checking out my Patreon or my other social medias, all my links are in the description. I hope you're all doing well and had a great weekend. I'll see you guys on the next one.